Uh, hello everyone, in this video we are going to talk about the medullary syndromes. But before we go and talk about the medullary syndromes in proper, we should know about the blood supply of the medulla. As you can see, this is uh, there are two vertebral arteries which are joining to form one basilar artery. Before the vertebral arteries join to form the basilar artery, they give two medial small branches of arteries which join together to form the anterior spinal artery. So these two small uh, blood vessels which are given medially, they supply most part of medial part of medulla. And uh, before that they give one more artery, the smaller ones here, uh, which is called as the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is uh, right here. And this artery will supply most part of lateral part of medulla. So you should keep in mind that any thrombus or emboli or any constriction in the medial branches uh, which are supplying medial part of medulla will cause a lesion in the medial part of medulla and hence th this will cause medial medullary syndromes whereas if the posterior inferior cerebellar artery is involved that is the pica is involved then you'll have a lesion in the lateral part of medulla which is called as lateral medullary syndrome and because it is uh, due to any obstruction in the posterior inferior cerebellar artery this uh, lateral medullary syndrome is also called as the pica syndrome now that we're done with the blood supply, let's focus on the two medullary syndromes. One is the medial medullary syndrome and the other one is the lateral medullary syndrome. First, we'll focus on the medial medullary syndrome, which is also called as the digerine syndrome. Uh, to know what the symptoms or the signs are there in a medial medullary syndrome, we should know what structures you get in the medial part of medulla from when you go from anterior to posterior. So this is a sec uh, section of the medulla. And uh, as you go from anterior to posterior, first you'll get the pyramids, that's basically the corticospinal tract. Then behind that you'll get the medial lemniscus, which is basically the fibers from the dorsal column tracts after they have decussated in the medulla. Then posteriorly, if you go, you'll get the hypoglossal nerve nucleus. So these three structures are the important structures which are present in the medial part of medulla. So our presentation, clinical presentation will also be depending upon these structures which have been involved. Again, anterior to posterior, if you go, the structures involved will be the pyramid, the medial lemniscus, the hypoglossal nucleus, and the hypoglossal nerve. Now, now that we know what are the structures involved, let's take a scenario. Uh, what if we have a lesion in the left side of the medial part of medulla? You should remember the three structures which are uh, involved in the lesion from anterior to posterior. It's the pyramid then the medial lemniscus and then the hypoglossal nerve nucleus. So the lesions also will talk about from anterior to posterior structures. Because the pyramid is involved, uh, you'll get a motor deficit and because the medial lemniscus is involved, you'll get a sensory deficit. But you should remember that the pyramid, whenever you're talking about the pyramid, these fibers decussate at the lower part of medulla. Hence, if there's a lesion in the left part of medulla, then because the fibers are supplying right side of the body, they cause a motor loss in the right side of the body. Here, right side, up limb and lower limb are involved. And because the pyramids cause a UMN type of lesion, these all the features in the left, uh, right side hemiplegia, whatever you get, will be features of UMN uh, palsy. For example, there will be increased tone, there will be exaggerated uh, deep tendon reflexes and the Bebinski sign will be positive in this case. Next, we'll, fo uh, we'll focus on the sensory loss. This sensory loss is because of the medial lemniscus involvement. You have to take a note that these dorsal column tracts, they decussate in the lower part of medulla and then ascend in the medial lemniscus. So, if there is a lesion in the left side medial lemniscus, then there will be a contralateral sensory loss because decussation has already occurred. And in the contralateral segment, there will be loss of sensations carried by the dorsal column tracts which are basically proprioception, vibration sense, tactile frematis, oh sorry, tactile discrimination and there will be loss of stereognosis. So posterior column tract sensations will be lost on the contralateral side. The last uh, uh, thing which is involved in the medial medullary syndrome is the hypoglossal nerve, that's the 12th cranial nerve. You have to note that the hypoglossal nerve does not decussate. It supplies the same side. Hence, the deviation or the lesion or this presentation will be ipsilateral side 
and deviation of the tongue when you ask the patient to protrude the tongue will be on the same side deviation now that we're done with the medial medullary syndrome let's focus on the lateral medullary syndrome as told previously the lateral medullary syndrome occurs whenever this involvement of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery hence this syndrome is also called as the pica syndrome and it's also called as the wallenberg syndrome to know what are the presentation of this syndrome again we are going to focus on the structures or the anatomical structures which are involved whenever there is a lateral medullary syndrome uh, you have to take note that there is a cerebellar peduncle which is involved then there is the vestibular nucleus this is one of the component of the eighth cranial nerve then you have the uh, trigeminal nerve spinal nucleus then there's the nucleus ambiguus which is important which supplies cranial nerve 9 and 10 and lateral spinothalamic tract is involved so make a note of these structures which are involved whenever there's a lateral medullary syndrome again we'll take an example we have to imagine that there's a lesion in the left side of the lateral medulla see again uh, we'll uh, divide the uh, presentation into a sensory loss a motor loss and the cranial nerve involvement firstly we'll focus on the sensory loss sensory loss is because of involvement of lateral spinothalamic tract if you go back to your neuroanatomy you'll uh, remember or recall that the spinothalamic tracts whenever they, the fibers start they ascend one or two segments and immediately decussate in the spinal cord itself so when we're taking a section at the medulla it means the fibers have already decussated so a lesion in the left side of the lateral medulla means the sensations are lost on the contralateral side because decussation has already occurred in the spinal cord this means loss of sensations with regard to the lateral spinothalamic tract which is basically the pain and temperature will be lost on the contralateral side now the another system which is involved will be the cerebral peduncle that means the spinocerebellar tract is also involved again if you recall from your neuroanatomy you will remember that the spinocerebellar tracts do not decussate they just ascend in the same side therefore a spinocerebellar tract involvement means ataxia will be on the same side that is if there's a lesion on the left side the ataxia will also be on the left side itself next we'll go to the cranial nerve involvement cranial nerve involvement as told because first is the fifth cranial nerve where there was a spinal nucleus involved because this uh, trigeminal nerve does not decussate the loss of sensations will be on the same side that is the left side in this case there will be loss of touch and pain on the left half of the face next vestibular nucleus was involved the, and there is no decussation hence there is nystagmus and vertigo on the same side nucleus ambiguous is involved this nucleus ambiguous is important because it supplies both cranial nerve 9 and cranial nerve 10 and hence there will be ipsilateral loss of all the functions supplied by the cranial nerve 9 and 10 person will have dysphagia uh, and irregular movements and the person will not be able to mix his food in the mouth properly because of these cranial nerves which are involved and the you should remember that the sympathetic fibers which are descending they are also placed laterally in the medulla hence if this are involved then you'll get all features of horner syndrome in the figure you will see ipsilateral desitosis uh, there was a left sided lesion in the medulla so there was here the left eye involved ptosis is present and meiosis is present if you compare it to the right eye this left pupil will is a meiotic pupil and there may be other features like anhydrosis and there'll be loss of celiospinal reflex that's it in this video so the only two things you uh, take home messages to know the syndrome you should know the proper neuroanatomy that is the structures which are involved and their functions then you can write down the clinical presentations properly thank you for watching